Musagaki Masao never imagined that his life would end in a bang. Literally. That fateful day, his favorite Red Hot Chili actress released a new video, and being the dedicated fan he is, Peter Piper picked his peck of pickled peppers to it. And if you're wondering how much wood did that woodchuck chuck? Well, the answer is enough to kill a man. Literally. Be it rotten luck or maybe the powers that be pitied his pickled pepper and thought it deserved to be free. But the floor of his apartment suddenly gave in, causing him to fall to his death. The next thing Masao knows, he's kneeling before a stunning goddess named Ada Ruto. She has seen her fair share of earthly weirdness. However, Masao's death takes the cake. I mean, death by cuffing the carrot? That's a rare way to go. While the goddess goes on about his demise, Masao regrets the way his life ended. Damn, why couldn't he have died under a woman's peach? Oh, right, that's impossible since he still has his V-card intact. Great, another reason to be depressed. In desperation, he asks goddess Ada if she can help him graduate from his chastity, but without skipping a beat, she says a pure boy like him won't be able to satisfy her. Maybe he can try asking her again in a few hundred years. That said, she can help him by reincarnating his pitiful soul in a world where he can enjoy a sussy life. She will even bless him with the ability to understand the language there. With that settled, Goddess Ada kisses our boy's mic as a special parting gift before sending him off. When Masao regains consciousness, he finds himself in a pitch black place with no memory of how he got there. He also doesn't seem to remember how to move his body. Then, as if he isn't confused enough, he suddenly feels something cold and wet dripping on his body. Is it raining? What the hell is going on? It's at this moment that it dawns on Masao how ill his luck is. First, he dies chaste. And now this? Goddess Ada said she'd reincarnate him so he could fulfill his fantasies. But this feels more like retribution. Is this his punishment for dying in such a stupid way? Deep in self-pity, all Masao does is cry. Out of nowhere, he hears a child calling his mom, saying he found a baby. Worried, the woman immediately checks what her child is talking about, only to confirm that there really is an abandoned baby in the forest. But who would do such a thing? Their village isn't poor enough for anyone to do this. Meanwhile, Masao gets the gist of what happened to him. He has been reincarnated as a baby. So that's why he can't move earlier. I gotta say though, this makes for a good sob story. The woman then checks his crib, and there she sees a letter stating that his name is Sao, Maybe the Ma got washed in the rain or something? Either way, that's his new name now. After that, the woman took Sao in and brought him to her home. She bathed him, nursed him, and cared for him as if he were her real child. From now on, I'm going to be your mother, she gently tells him. Sadly though, he still can't see her face clearly. After a few months, Sao's vision improves and he finally sees what his savior looks like. Whoa, damn! I feel like we just discovered two new planets, chat? Wait, what are the requirements? It must be big enough to have enough gravity to force it into a spherical shape. Yeah, check. It must be big enough that its gravity has cleared away any other objects. Yeah, double check. Woo. Anyway, this beautiful mama is Machetto and she kindly picks up her baby to nurse him. Unbeknownst to her, her supposed little angel is a freaking freak who's enjoying the process a little too much. So yeah, we've all read enough manga to know that the next panel is a heaping spoonful of kya. After that, Machetto takes Sao outside, where they are greeted by their neighbor. They talk about the difficulty that comes with raising two children alone, and how the community the kids live in plays a significant role in their welfare. It takes a village to raise a child, right? Hearing all this, Sao feels grateful that he was reincarnated in a world where kids like him are well-loved. He truly is a lucky baby. All of a sudden, the peaceful atmosphere gets ruined when a gaiju appears and causes havoc in the village. Though Sao is fortunately unharmed, thanks to Machetto, he is shaken at the sight of the fearsome beast. He's hit with the realization that he was born in a world where monsters exist. And judging by the swift reaction of the villagers, it doesn't seem like this attack is an isolated case. Thankfully, they were able to subjugate the beast, and no one got hurt in the end. Sao's village is located in the middle of a forest, meaning it is surrounded by dangerous beasts. But despite that, the villagers aren't the slightest bit afraid because, well, they're like animals too. Take tonight, for example. Sao can hear the action happening in the house next door. The houses here are made of wood, so it's easy to tell when someone's having a fun time in P-Town. 
Actually, no, scratch that. Regardless of the material of the houses, the people here are not ashamed to lay some pipe. Young or old, men or women. Everyone here is open-minded. Even Granny can pull a dashing youngin. As such, it's the perfect environment for Sao to grow in. A few years passed, and our boy is now seven years old. He has grown really close with Machito over the years, and that's partly because he's a shameless Lil Runt who likes cosplaying as a sandwich with Mama's buns. Though she doesn't mind pampering him, Machetto says that he cannot act this way forever. Sure, she loves him, and he's adorable, but he'll partake in the ritual today, meaning he's a step closer to becoming an adult. God will finally bestow him an ability that will determine his job and role in this world. Quite frankly, Sao was surprised when he first heard all about the job-calling ritual. He didn't have this sort of thing in his previous world, so this is new to him. Still, he's fine with whatever job he gets as long as it allows him to do some horizontal dancing. That's what he's here for, after all. Before long, the mom and son duo arrive at the church where the ritual will be held. They're greeted by the villagers who are eager to find out what Sao's job will be. He could become a carpenter, lumberjack, hunter, or farmer. Whatever it may be, he needs to make sure to polish and sharpen his skills. Who knows? Maybe the nobles or the royal capital will hire him if he becomes an exemplary knight, scholar, or magician. You see, the possibilities are endless. Having said that, Machetto openly expresses how sad she'll be if her baby bird has to leave her nest. Shortly after, the priest declares that the ritual will now begin. Sao was relaxed when he came here earlier, but now he's somehow filled with butterflies. Goddess Ada said she'd give him a special gift, so hopefully she would stay true to her word. Before letting him approach the priest, though, Machetto kisses him on the forehead and assures him that he need not worry about what kind of job he'll get, because it's a gift from God, no matter what it is. With that, Sao comes forward and kneels before the altar. The priest immediately starts the ritual. He closes his eyes, concentrating and waiting for God's word. But much to his confusion, he receives word that Sao's job is called Rodmaster. Needless to say, everyone in the church is puzzled. Sao, on the other hand, is nervous and sweating bullets. Is this the special gift Goddess Ada was talking about? No matter how much he thinks about it, this job is nuts. No pun intended. He knows this village is open-minded, but this is just taking it too far. What are the people going to think about him now? Just then, the villagers ask the priest what a rodmaster is. It has the word rod in it, so is it related to farming? Fishing, perhaps? This is when it dawns on Sao that this world doesn't understand slang words. Phew, what a relief. He can't imagine having to go through the embarrassment of explaining what Rod means. Aside from Sao, not one person in that church knows what a Rod master is. Yet they're all genuinely happy for him. The villagers, Machetto, and the priest, they all believe that God gave him that occupation with a purpose. After all, these jobs are bestowed upon them so they can live in abundance. Hearing their words of encouragement, Sao can't help but feel his heart swell. These people love and support him, and for that, he's thankful. But do you want to know what else he's feeling? He's excited, like hella excited. With this job and the knowledge he has from his previous life, he can finally sing praises of Eero in this world. Upon their arrival home, Kalipa, Machetto's kid, teases Sao for the odd job he got. In a mocking tone, he says, mine's better in comparison. After all, I'm a knight. Hearing this, Machetto lectures him, saying that if he really wants to be a full-fledged knight, he must learn to be polite and kind to others. In fact, he can start now by being nice to his younger brother. But instead of heeding his mom's words, Kalipa gets even more annoyed. Seeing his brat of a younger brother cling to his mom just annoys him to the core. Unlike Sao, who's still eager to drink mother's milk, Kalipa is a knight, so he doesn't need to be coddled like a baby. One day he will serve a noble family, and by then, he will kiss this countryside life goodbye. Having said that, he asks his mom for a sword or a spear. Machetto's answer to this is firm but gentle. No, you can't. She knows that all jobs need appropriate equipment, but it's too early for her son to handle a sword or a spear. As expected, this greatly frustrates Kalipa. His friends already have the necessary equipment, so he just doesn't understand why he can't have them too. Unable to contain his emotions, he storms off after questioning his mom's stinginess. With her eldest gone, all Machetto can do is slump on a chair. Raising kids sure is tough. Thankfully, Sao is a kind and sweet boy. As she gets a massage from him, she expresses her own frustrations. 
Machetto understands Kalipa's adoration for knights. However, kids holding sharp weapons can be very dangerous. Those with jobs are able to manifest a huge amount of strength, especially those who have suitable gear. For example, a knight wielding a sword can slice through rocks and trees like butter. Can you imagine what would happen if a child accidentally hits someone with that force? While Machetto is busy explaining herself, Sao is relishing in the sweet scent he can smell from her. Massaging her like this, he can't help but go a wooga booga. Strangely enough, he hears his mom's voice tremble as she speaks. If he didn't know any better, he'd say she's getting the tingles. Then, out of nowhere, her milky ways suddenly come out of hiding. Whoa, Sao has been giving her massages every day. But this has never happened before. Could this be one of his skills as a rodmaster? Once Machetto has calmed down, she states how she believes that both of her children are going through a growth period. That said, she wonders what Sao's equipment is and what his job entails. He's the first one to get the job of Rodmaster, so they will have to rely on his intuition since no one knows anything about it. Knowing the nature of his job, Sao knows that his weapon will probably be a forbidden cob or something. Wait, does this world even have those kinds of stuff? Nonetheless, since he doesn't know what his equipment is yet, Sao holds the weapon he has had with him since he was young. His train of thought is then interrupted when his mom asks him to help in preparing dinner. She hands him some kitchen tools, and as soon as Sao takes one of them, he feels as though he has been awakened. The next day, Kalipa wakes Sao and invites him to go out, saying he will serve as his retainer today. He's going on about how much of a coward his friends are when he suddenly notices his younger brother holding a pestle. Realizing that it's a tool for his job, Kalipa bursts into laughter. In Sao's defense, though, he literally can't let go of the pestle. Before long, the two head to the forest for some pretend play. Well, to be exact, Sao is humoring Kalipa so he won't throw a temper tantrum. They aren't even supposed to be in this forest in the first place because it's dangerous. Sigh. Honestly, Sao doesn't want to be here. But he knows their mom will be sad if anything happens to his brother, so he doesn't have a choice but to watch over him. Anyway, Today, they're here to hunt some pretend monsters, or in other words, wild rabbits. But for some reason, they can't seem to find any signs of animals. Not even their shadow. It's at this moment that Sao feels a sense of unease creeping up within him. Something doesn't feel right. The forest isn't supposed to be this quiet. He suggests they go home. However, Kalipa insists they march on until they find prey. Sadly, this bravado is short-lived as the two kids unexpectedly find themselves standing before an enormous beast called Devil Bear. Fear courses through their veins as they stand frozen, paralyzed by fear. In a hushed tone, Sao tells Kalipa to slowly take a step back, but he stumbles and ends up falling on top of him instead. This is the first time Sao has seen his brother scared. And honestly, he looks kind of cute. And like, his Princess Peach is cute too? Now it could be the adrenaline talking, or maybe something's awakening inside him. Whatever the case, our boy knows they both can't die here. Neither of them has fulfilled their dreams yet, so death isn't an option for them. Just as the bear is about to attack, Sao feels something move inside his pants. No, it isn't his peepee, -pee, it's the pestle. He grabs it out of curiosity, and as soon as he does, it grows in size and length, shoving the beast's arm. Wait, could this kitchen tool be his designated weapon? There's only one way to find out. Though the now elongated pestle is heavy, Sao uses every fiber of his strength to swing it to strike the towering bear. He feels bad for trespassing on its territory, but being in a kill or be killed situation, he doesn't have a choice but to fight. Finally, with a swift and powerful blow, he plunges the pestle into the bear's eye, causing it to roar and flee in agony. With the adrenaline now gone, Sao feels as though his arm is about to fall off. Thankfully, the pestle is now back to its original size. Can you imagine how he's going to bring that thing home had it not shrunk? Yeah, me neither. Just then, he notices his brother had accidentally peed himself. He urges him to take his soiled pants off so he won't get sick. But as always, Kalipa refuses to listen. Maybe if they hadn't just survived a bear attack, he'd let his brother be. However, at this point, Sao is fed up with his brother's stubbornness, and so he forcefully takes his pants off. But much to his surprise, he discovers that his dear brother doesn't have a wee-wee. Needless to say, our boy is astonished and embarrassed at the same time. As he returns Kalipa's pants, he ponders why she never corrected him whenever he referred to her as his brother. 
Now that he thinks about it, she has always played with boys instead of girls. So it's possible that they have influenced her behavior. That doesn't explain why Sao never realized that she was a girl, though. They even took baths in public bathhouses together. All right, maybe that's his fault for not paying attention to anything except for Machetto's machetos. But still, he can't believe he didn't even suspect that his brother is actually his sister. That said, it's strange how she claimed to be a man when he asked her earlier. Curious as to why she said this, he asks, Hey, do you want to live as a man? Without skipping a beat, Kalipa confirms Sao's suspicion. With tears in her eyes, she explains that this is because no one would recognize her talent as a knight because she's a girl. The ones who told her about this were the boys from the village, and it has always been on her mind since then. Though she often teases Sao about being spoiled, seeing him fight the bear earlier proves that he's actually very strong. As for her, all she did was pee her pants. That only proves to her that a woman can never really be a knight. This is the first time Sao heard Kalipa talk like this. She has always been so sure of herself, yet she seems so vulnerable now. Who would have thought she had a cute side to her? Bro, focus. Now's not the time to be ogling. Quite frankly, Sao doesn't know if this world allows females to become knights. However, even if it doesn't, he wants Kalipa to know that he will support her no matter what. Besides, he understands what it feels like to have a dream. He isn't going to tell her what it is, but one thing's for sure. He will turn it into reality one day. Having said that, the siblings decide to make a promise, with Sao stating that he will become a strong rodmaster and Kalipa swearing that she will someday become a knight. From there, the two underwent rigorous training together. Days turned into months, and months turned into years. Now, what these two are doing in the middle of a freaking forest is what most people refer to as Sweet Home Alabama. That doesn't mean they've given up on reaching their dreams, though. In fact, they're doing this because Sao's pestle only grows or activates once he's riled up, meaning he can only train or hunt after a horizontal tango since his pestle will have extended by a couple meters. Sage mode? Irrelevant to a rodmaster. Okay, maybe these two just like to do it every day like rabbits, but the point is their relationship has drastically improved, and that's what's important. Sao also notes that he misses Kalipa's stuck-upness, to which she yells that that's her dark history, but he's already helped her out of it. After their whole ordeal, Sao complains that she enjoyed herself way too much. They went to the forest under the pretense of deer hunting, but now they don't have the time to do that. Eh, skill issue. Kalipa doesn't mind if the other villagers found out about what they're up to, but Sao thinks they should still keep things under wraps. Speaking of under wrap, Kalipa suddenly remembers how his pestle was during the bear incident. She was still posing as a boy back then. So does that mean he was thrilled by her boy version? No comment. After that, they proceed to hunt a deer to take home. Sao's weapon is much longer, so he's the one who gets the kill while Kalipa handles the dismantling. This doesn't make her happy, though, as she feels that Sao always has the upper hand in everything, which is becoming increasingly frustrating for her. Moreover, she doesn't like how he sometimes treats her like a child. On their way home, Kalipa suddenly gets an idea of how she can finally defeat Sao in hunting. She trains her legs and thighs every day, so she's much faster than him. This entails that she can fill the gap of his reach by being quick on her feet. As such, she asks that they test it out. Sao initially refuses, saying they're almost home, but he ultimately gives in after she swears that she'll be quick. The next thing our boy knows, Kalipa's lips are pressed on his. Wait, aren't surprise attacks against the way of a knight? That's just cheating. She knows he has a soft spot for her. That aside, though Sao appreciates that Kalipa wants to get closer to him, he reminds her that they are nearing the village, meaning they must be careful about how they act around each other. They don't want their mom to find out about this now, do they? But since they're already at it, they go at it. Unbeknownst to them, someone suspicious is watching them from afar. On their way home, the two come across one of their neighbors who muses how much Kalipa has grown. She can't believe the troublesome girl she used to be has grown to become such a fine lady. Oh, how the time flies. They then get stopped by Rebo, who invites Kalipa to have dinner at their place. Though he says his stumbling upon her is a coincidence, it's evident by the way he blushes that he has been waiting for her. Anyway, Rebo is a chef, so Kalipa is certain that his cooking is amazing. However, she rejects his offer, saying she will have dinner with her family tonight. With that, she heads home with her brother. Ah, oh, don't worry, Rebo. 
you're not alone in the boys rejected by Calipa Club. Upon their arrival, the siblings are welcomed by their beloved mother. A lot of things have changed since Sao arrived in this world, but there are two things that remain the same. One, Machetto's youthful look, and two, Hermelins' destructive power. He just can't seem to get enough of those things. That said, Sao feels as though he's the luckiest guy in the world to live with two very beautiful women. Goddess Ada really did him a favor by reincarnating him in this world. Soon, the three share a meal at the dinner table. As they eat, Machetto expresses how she was initially worried that her kids went to the forest to hunt. But seeing how they're successful at bringing a game, she realizes they aren't children anymore and that it's time that they help her with her work. You see, she has another job aside from farming, one she has never told them about before. Listening to her words, it dawns on Sao how Machetto often leaves their home very early and returns late at night. She has been working this hard since he and Kalipa were young, yet they never once felt neglected. Having said that, he's curious as to what kind of job has been keeping her so busy. And so, without hesitation, he agrees to accompany her to her next job. Heck, he can even help her every day if that's what she wants. As for Kalipa, she comments on how her dear brother is such a mama's boy. But she ultimately agrees to accompany her mom, too. With that settled, they all head to bed, as they will leave early tomorrow. The next day, Machetto leads Sao and Kalipa deep into the forest while carrying heavy luggage. Though the two aren't strangers when it comes to this place, this is their first time going in this deep. Walking behind their mother, they wonder what kind of job she could be doing to come here with such heavy equipment. Soon, they come across a group of intimidating people. Now, I know it isn't nice to judge a book by its cover, but these men are giving bandit vibes. Much to Kalipa and Sao's astonishment, though, Machetto approaches and thanks the men for their patience. Then she exclaims, We'll be counting on you for today, too. But do you want to know what's even more surprising? These men answer her with, Yes, ma'am. Seeing the confused look on her kids' faces, Machetto finally reveals that she has been working as a goblin slayer in secret all this time. Kalipa and Sao have two very different ideas about what a goblin slayer is. The one thing they have in common, though, is that they're both wrong. Whatever the case, the thought that their mom is a goblin slayer seems far-fetched. Neither of them has seen a goblin before, so this revelation honestly seems like a joke. Then, as if to prove that their race is real, a group of bloodthirsty goblins suddenly attack them. With their weapons in hand, they charge at the men who attack them in return. Still, this doesn't explain why Machetto, their sweet, sweet mom, is here. This place is much too dangerous for someone like her. There's just no way this is the other job she was talking about. Just then, one of the men gets stabbed in the commotion, and Machetto aids him right away. Watching her move with precision, it dawns on Sao how his mom is probably here to tend to the wounded. She does a splendid job of aiding him whenever he gets injured, so it makes sense that this is her role here. Sao's train of thought is then interrupted when Mr. Tagayasu, their neighbor, suddenly calls him and Kalipa. Seeing as this is their first time here, he takes the liberty to explain things to them. He says this place is where relatively strong people from different villages gather to slay goblins. And since Machetto brought them here, he assumes that she recognized their potential and wanted them to learn how to hunt. Quite frankly, Sao doesn't care whether he and Kalipa are strong enough to be here or not, because right now, he's just so filled with worry for his mom. She may not be fighting per se, but her job of tending to the injured is still dangerous. Who knows what might happen to her? She isn't like Mr. Tageyasu, who has hunted huge bears and boars. She only knows farm and needlework. Just seconds after he says that, Sao's fear comes true as a goblin sneakily attacks his mom from behind. But while fear takes hold of him and Kalipa, Mr. Tagayasu doesn't seem to be the slightest bit worried. As they watch Machetto block the attack, he explains that their mother isn't as fragile as they think. She isn't a farmer, doctor, or seamstress. She's an axe-wielding, goblin-beheading warrior. And she isn't just any warrior either. She's the strongest of them all. To back Mr. Tagayasu's words, Machetto clarifies that the sole purpose of people gathering in this place is to eradicate goblins until they are completely eliminated. If it were up to her, she would prefer not to show this side of her to her children. However, the goblin footprints they saw near their village call for it. 
These beasts are cunning monsters that often attack livestock and humans. On their own, they are weak, but in a group, they're troublesome. Sadly, their numbers increased recently, so there's no telling when they'll show up in the forest. There's even a chance that some of them were keeping an eye out on them yesterday. With this in mind, Machetto decided to let her children know of the danger of these beasts. After all, it's better that they experience fighting them here than facing them alone later. Thankfully, Sao and Kalipa both understand their mother's decision to keep her job a secret. They she told them earlier that she's been doing something this fun, though. With that said, it's time that they get their hands dirty. Though Sao confidently tells his mom he'll take on the goblins, killing them isn't as fun as he thought. Sure, he can end them with one blow, but the bloody view makes his stomach churn. Honestly speaking, he's only doing this because these beasts are threatening his hot yoga time in the forest, and that's something he can never give up. As for Kalipa, she's as lively as ever. Heck, she even looks like she's enjoying herself. Watching her skewer the goblins like a kebab, Sao wonders where the girl who wet herself years ago went. Machetto then commends him for utilizing his skill and job well. To be able to fight and hunt with a pestle isn't something you see every day, after all. Out of nowhere, Kalipa joins their conversation, adding that her dear brother has another skill he's amazing at aside from extending his rod. This, of course, flusters Sao. Seriously, what is this girl thinking? Desperate to keep her mouth shut, he covers Kalipa's mouth and gives her a look that says, Zip it! They can't let their mom know about their secret relationship no matter what happens. After all, Machetto isn't just Sao's adoptive mom. She's also his lifesaver and a first love. As such, he doesn't want her to be disappointed in him. Anyway, he hasn't mentioned this before, but Sao is actually weak against blood, so much so that his weapon reverts back to its original size at the mere sight of it. But since he has been exposed to so much gore since earlier, his pestle shrinks to the size of a walnut. Kalipa is playfully suggesting they do something naughty about his problem when Machetto suddenly grabs the now shrunken weapon and plays with it. The next thing everyone knows, the pestle is back to its long, hard, and thick self again. Knowing full well what this means, Kalipa storms off after declaring that she will fight goblins on her own. Machetto is about to run after her daughter when a mob of goblins suddenly appear and attacks her. With no other choice, she prompts Sao to chase after his sister, saying he must aid his sister since fighting goblins alone is dangerous. As he looks for Kalipa, Sao ponders how conflicted he feels. He loves his mom just as much as he loves his sister. There's no way he can choose between them. You know what they say, love transcends family ties. Just kidding, no one says that. Like ever. My boy right here just really is all sorts of messed up. Anyway, Sao soon finds Kalipa, but to his horror, she's wounded. Before pulling the arrow on her thigh, she exclaims how she doesn't need anything plunging inside her other than Sao's third leg. Wrong move, sister. Wrong move. She then coughs up blood, suggesting that the arrow is poisoned. With her sight going hazy and consciousness slowly fading, it's evident that she doesn't have much time left. Meanwhile, Sao is panicking like crazy. He doesn't know what to do, but one thing's for sure. He can't let Kalipa die. And so, in a moment of desperation, he does the only thing he can think of. He buries her bone in her. You see, he has a special skill called paramedic, with the stress placed on the last syllable, which basically means that his cobra has healing properties. It's so effective that Kalipa instantly feels better after just a few seconds. And while they're at it, they also make up for the misunderstanding they had earlier. Unfortunately, the two still aren't in the clear because they soon discover that they're surrounded by goblins. It'll be difficult for Kalipa to fight in her current condition, so they ultimately decide to take on the beasts while she's straddling Sao. Of course, this greatly helps him too, because the thrill is keeping his pestle from shrinking with all the goblin blood splattering around. In the end, the two effectively eliminate all the goblins. With what they have just been through, they can only laugh at the new fighting method they accidentally discovered. All things considered, everything is panning out exactly as Sao wanted. He died as a chaste man in his first life, but that's not the case anymore. Now, not only does he have a special ability that is heavy on the sussy, but he's also surrounded by beautiful women who love him dearly. And what else can we say, folks, if not? That should have been me. Subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.